Deanna Kujek, and I'm a cardiologist here at the University Hospital. And Kim has asked me to talk about um, Nepal and basically a land where there is um, not much technology available. And what I'm planning on doing over the next half an hour or so is to describe life in Nepal as I observed it during two trips to Nepal. And the medical needs and the shifting in medical needs from communicable diseases to non-communicable diseases. And also the use of technology in a low-income country. The promise and the potential problems. So first of all, a few words about Nepal. So Nepal is a mountainous country between China, Tibet, and India in the south. And um, on the east, it's uh, Bangladesh is very close, as is Bhutan. And you can see that uh, the northern part of Nepal is very mountainous. And of the um, 14 peaks that are over 8,000 meters in the world, eight of them are in Nepal. So very, uh, very high mountains. And then in brown, you have what's called the hills. And this is where a lot of people live. Um, and not many physicians, as I'll get into. And then closer to India in the green is the Terai, which are like the plains, very hot and arid. So Nepal has a population, almost just a little less than Canada, about 30 million people. And the main religion is Hindu. It is the birthplace of Buddha. The language is Nepali, although there are many other different languages. There are more than 100 different ethnic groups in Nepal. But they do speak this common language. And the currency is the Nepali rupee. So the WHO data on Nepal um, is that 80% of the population is rural. Um, and depends on agriculture for, for livelihood. And agriculture accounts for only 40% of the country's GDP. Remittance from foreign employment is the major income source for Nepal. So at any one time, about 18% of the Nepalese citizens are working abroad, more than any other country. And it's really striking when you're at the airport in Kathmandu to see all these young men lined up to go work in China and the Middle East. So just a really major drain out of the country. The population living below the national poverty line is, was 31% in 2004, and I think that's gradually improving. The adult literacy rate is about 50%. Not great, especially in rural Nepal. Big difference between rural and urban. So Nepal is a country of great beauty, and that's obviously what drew me to Nepal and what draws NGOs from many countries, many well-developed countries around the world to Nepal. It's, it's the Himalaya. And they are astoundingly beautiful mountains uh, with the clouds constantly uh, like traveling through the peaks. It's like incredibly beautiful. Uh, so the first part, I'm just going to talk to you about my, my trek in Nepal a year ago in October of um, 2010, and uh, this was my first visit to Asia, so, <laughs> so it, was, it was quite a, a, change, a change of culture. But it did give me the opportunity to travel through rural Nepal, through the mountains, for three weeks with, our, with a huge group of, of porters, like we were a group of 30 people. So first of all, you fly from Kathmandu, which is uh, a sprawling city of more than about a million and a half. You fly to this uh, town in the, in the mountains called Lukla. And uh, these the major, well, larger villages in the mountains have airstrips. And you know, that's great, but that's only good when the weather allows flights into the area. And many times, there's many crashes at this airport in Lukla, which is one of the major airports, which is the major airport to get into the Kumbu Valley. And at the top of the Kumbu Valley is Mount Everest. So very popular, and all these people you hear about going to Everest Base Camp, they fly to Lukla, which is about a 45-minute flight out of Kathmandu. But you can see it's quite a small little runway, um, and they use these otter planes, and uh, you know, you're just hoping that the pilot will land at the, at the end of that runway and stop before they reach the barricade at the other end. And you just 
learned like in Nepal, like things are just out of your control and whatever will happen will happen. Their safety standards are much different than North American <laughs> standards. It's just a fact of life. And you know, this, this is like one of the wealthiest villages because it's gotten so much foreign aid thanks to Edmund Hillary, um, who always credited the Sherpas with the successful ascent of Everest in 1953, so there's a lot of Western money that has come into Lukla, and they have a lovely hospital funded by a Swiss NGO, but when I was there, they didn't have any doctors, they didn't have any staff, and that hospital was just closed off. So, you know, sometimes money goes into, into equipment and buildings, but not enough to cover operating costs, and that's really a problem with sustainable development in, in these um, low-income countries. It's not enough to build things, you have to make sure they function and that local people are involved. And you know, the trekking, to, we were in the Hinku Valley, which has no permanent villages, just tea houses that open during the trekking season. And the trekking season is in, in the fall and in the spring when, when there's not much rainfall. And you know, these are the little, these are basically the roads. There's no vehicles at all, like after you leave Kathmandu. Um, and you fly into Lukla from there, it's just these mountain trails. And so if you're sick, or a family member is sick, you have to come back out through these little trails. And people will carry you, of course, if you're, if you're required. But there's a good chance, if you're seriously sick, of dying. Because there's no rapid transportation out, unless you have money and weather provides um, an airplane, a, a helicopter can come in and uh, pick you up. And while we were trekking, you know, one of our Sherpas was feeling unwell. It's really hard to get a sense of what the problem was. But he said he had heart problems and he had to go back to a village close to Lukla and get his medications. And he had to trek up this high mountain pass to reach his, um, his home. It's just totally different from the way it is in uh, North America. And the porters carry these very heavy loads. Many come from the Terai, so they're actually not acclimatized to the high altitude and the, and the hypoxemia. Uh, but they do this for, for the little bit of money that they make, um, just a few dollars a day. And they're carrying loads of up to 60 kilograms. And the amazing thing is that they carry these heavy loads on their foreheads. So that, um, that cloth that you see around their forehead goes around the basket. And on this basket is piled, you know, toilets, <laughs> uh, huge pots and pans and stoves, and, and uh, you know, it's their employment and they're happy to carry these very heavy weights. And I found in Nepal, like, human labor is cheap, really cheap. Now, I tried to carry one of these loads and I could only stagger a few steps, and these are, the, these are two of our porters. Most of the porters are male, but we actually had two female porters with us, and they were laughing and trying to help me, but, you know, I'm, I'm bigger and heavier than they are, and I could only walk a few steps with this load that they were carrying, you know, for eight hours a day. So pretty incredibly strong, but mainly motivated because they need the money. And they learned to do this at a very young age, carrying not as many. And you know, these are the primitive uh, stone hovels um, in the Hinku Valley. And uh, they're called tea houses. But I just wanted, I felt like I was going back to the Middle Ages. You know, they're built, they're built of stone. And um, the roofs are, are made of aluminum, or there's not a lot of wood. There's been major deforestation in Nepal. So uh, they do, this one has a chimney, and so does the other one, but often the chimneys will be blocked off because they don't want the, and there's, they use fires for cooking. So it gets very smoky in there. So already you're hypoxemic because of the low barometric pressure, and now you have all the smoke in the lodge. So I could never stay in a lodge for very long. Unfortunately, we were camping, so we didn't have to sleep in the lodges. But um, I did find in Kathmandu when I was doing echocardiograms, there are a lot of people with chronic obstructive lung disease. And some of it is from smoking, and some is from uh, living in rural uh, environments within these um, poorly ventilated uh, hovels. It's just so poorly ventilated.
ventilated. And there's just total lack of sanitation. Like with our, with the, the outfitting company that we were with, uh, they have a very good reputation and they boiled all the water for us. And we also added um, Pristine to sterilize our water. Max and uh, water buffalo wandering through. So, um, so the water is uh, very contaminated. And, um, you know, the locals die of gastroenteritis. It's a major cause of death. And it's all because of the uh, basic lack of sanitation. But there were many, many good things in, um, in Nepal as well, in, in the mountains. And uh, the people of Nepal are really exceptionally, you know, they don't have much. But whatever they have, they'll try to help you out. And uh, this was Ang Shu, who was one of our cook's helpers. And, uh, you know, like, he would just bring this warm lemonade after after a hike to us and he was just like so happy to to help us out in any way possible and i think you know the lack of technology seems to bring people closer together because that's all they have they just have each other uh, in these in this very difficult environment and so so they help each other more close very close to each other they, they <laughs> a little too closely together, <laughs> large groups in small places, which spreads infection too, unfortunately. And then, you know, at the end of two weeks of trekking in the Hinku Valley, finally we, we got to our peak, which was Mira Peak, and very high peak, it's about 21,000 feet, and this is kind of the last little step on Jumar, Jumaring up a fixed rope to the summit. And, uh, you know, it's not a difficult climb, as climbs go, it's on a glacier. But I was so short of breath. It was just a, it was just a real lesson as to how patients with heart failure feel. Because you know, you're fine when you're resting, but you take a few steps and you're very short of breath. So you just have to pace yourself all the time until you come lower down again. Now, um, on our trek, there were there was well, first of all, a, a German tourist who developed gastroenteritis, which is like I think the major reason that tourists are evacuated from the Kumbu and the Hinku Valleys. So, uh, he, you know, once you get gastroenteritis at that altitude, you are very, very sick. And, you know, you can't drink, you can't hydrate, you're hypotensive. There's not a whole lot you can do. Like, we all carry gravel and ciprofloxacin with us, but this guy was, was vomiting, and I didn't have any IM medications to give. Um, so, anyways, the helicopter, he had, he had medical insurance, so the helicopter came into the valley, when the weather cleared a little bit, and evacuated the German tourists really quickly. And he would have been flown to a hospital in Kathmandu and gotten very good care. But um, two days later, a porter died um, of high altitude pulmonary edema. Like I mentioned, they do come from lower elevations, and they're carrying these very heavy loads at high altitude. It's not uncommon for porters to die during these uh, treks and expeditions. And, you know, you really count on a good Sirdar, uh, which is kind of a Sherpa, uh, the, the leader of the expedition, who is able to communicate with all the porters, because we can't. The porters are not educated, they don't speak English, they would never approach us. It takes a Sherpa or someone who has, who knows how to speak English, and knows what, what we have with us, you know, like we have oxygen, we have a gamma bag, a pressurized bag, uh, to deal with high altitude pulmonary edema. Um, but, you know, he, he just was feeling unwell, really unwell. He was being carried out, actually. And uh, he wanted to be left alone. And, of course, you know, when you're very sick, you're not thinking too clearly. So his friends left him alone, and they found him the next morning dead. And then four porters carried his body out. And, uh, yeah, it was very sad to see that covered body on the trail the next day. And just to know that he died like, you know, 50 meters from where I was sleeping, and there were other physicians there, and we had oxygen and everything that we could have easily saved this person, but um, we didn't know about the problem. So um, on this trip in the mountains, you know, obviously, I love the Himalaya, made me love the Rockies even more, because our Rockies are pristine wilderness. Uh, but the people were really lovely. 
um, and just, you know, living in such a, a, a harsh environment, like this, those two little boys who came to visit us um, at our tent, you know, just always happy to, uh, to have their picture taken or, or whatever. The two guys in the middle are Sherpa guides who've gone up Everest many times. For them, that's just a day in the office. They love Everest, because they get a lot of money for that. So that was my first trip to, to Nepal. And um, I was struck by how, uh, how difficult life is in, in the rural villages and the lack of sanitation. Just, I mean, we didn't get sick, but we were always cautious about the water. Now the second trip to Kathmandu um, was to work at the Patent Academy of Health Sciences. So I was there for five weeks in June and July of this year. Now, you know, I don't much like the city, especially a big disorganized city like that, to feel like I was doing something perhaps useful and I got to know a circle of people who, um, who I was able to interact with and who helped us out. The Patent Academy of Health Sciences um, you know, it was kind of interesting to be in such a strange environment. I felt like Alice in Wonderland <laughs> in a totally different world. And yet the hospital was still a hospital, like like this. You know, there's so many things in common. It's kind of seemed the technology was weird to have anything there. <laughs> because this is a place that doesn't have, like, proper toilets and water. Like, how could they even have an ICU and a ventilator? But all the equipment was, like, 30 or 40 years old. was in this, these big oxygen tanks. It wasn't like wall oxygen. Um, and then the IVs were in glass bottles as opposed to the bags that we have now. And the nurses, well, the nurses had caps, but there weren't many nurses. It was mainly families looking after patients. The families did everything for the patients. There'd be like six to eight patients in a room and sick people uh, with all kinds of problems, cirrhosis, TB, chronic obstructive lung disease, heart failure, so they're all in these rooms, and their families are, are feeding them, portering them to tests. Um, so I asked one of the doctors, what happens if you don't have a family here? And he said, well, you would die pretty quickly. There's just no um, so, you know, government-sponsored um, health care that would look after people who did not have a family. But families are extremely important. So, uh, you know, a lot of things were similar. So it gave some, and this was the cardiology block, so, you know, it gave some lectures. And the stu these are very young students. This is the first um, medical school class at the Patton Academy of Health Sciences. And the students are enrolled directly out of high school. And a lot of them come from villages. Um, so, you know, they're, they're young, they're enthusiastic, they, they talk a lot, they're kind of like politicians. Whoever talks the loudest and convinces other people that they're right, well, they've got to be right. It's, they're not really, you know, so thoughtful and um, thinking through problems. It's more like just, just memorizing and reciting things in a loud voice enthusiastically so other people believe what you say. So, you know, this is my uh, problem-based learning group, and I found like it was very different than here. Like you have to be, as a tutor, you have to be a lot more involved asking questions and not just listening to them debate things because it could get very entertaining, but it could be totally false too. And then I did some echocardiograms in the afternoon because they had one cardiologist at this hospital and he left to go to Bangladesh and do an interventional cardiology fellowship so he could come back and work at a private hospital in Kathmandu. Uh, Patton is a, is a government hospital. So I did some echocardiograms, and you know, the equipment, it was a challenge, because it was older equipment, but I found, you know, I, I was, it was a challenge to figure out how to make it work well for me, but, uh, but I adapted to that environment, and you know, patients have to pay for the test, and then you do the test, and, and take some, some, on a strip chart recorder, you just take a few prints of the screen, and then you write out the report, and you hand it to the patient, and the patient leaves. So there's no, like, medical records. I mean, there may be some in the hospital, but not in, not in the lab, anyways. The patients carry around their tests. Um, and then that's an actual picture of the, of the hospital, the Patton Hospital. So, so, you know, once I got to know these young people and other people at the Patton Hospital, it was, a, it was very nice. I mean, they were, let's say, you know, they were, they were simple, honest, enthusiastic people. 
and you know this was a lot better than life in the villages. So we lived in this uh, apartment here. That was a five-minute walk from the hospital, and you can see what a beautiful garden this is. Well, the person who owns this is an ex Gurkha. You probably know about the Gurkha soldiers. They were very highly valued in the British Army and the Indian Army because they were very brave. And they're Nepali, Nep Nepalese. From the, the Gurkhas are from around the Pokhara area. And because of their foreign service, they get a very nice pension. Even if they're killed, the families get the pension. So, you know, all the Nepalis want to work for work in the in the in the Gurkhas. Um, so when he retired, he was able to to buy this beautiful home, and we had the bottom flat, and, um, and it was very comfortable. I mean, there was running water. The water was brown, and you couldn't drink it, of course. And we got these big bottles of water, bottled water. And the water comes from wells. Uh, there's an example of a well, and I took a photograph down into the well, so it is very deep. And they haul it up in these big pails, and then pour it into bottles, and then you pick up the bottles at the corner store. And you know, the lady at our corner store got to know us, and was always looking out for us to make sure we were okay. So, you know, it, it was, it's a city, but it was very much a rural environment in the city. It, and it was nice, like at more, in the morning, at 4 o'clock in the morning, the roosters would wake you up. <laughs> and I just loved that. It was so, so peaceful. And there'd be celebrations in the middle of the street, like when a wedding took place, the, the wedding procession would go down the street in the neighborhood, and we'd be invited to join in the dancing. These are some medical students from UBC who also um, were down to to uh, work with Carol Ann Cornea, who's beside me in that photograph. She's a physiologist from UBC who's been involved with the Patent Academy since its inception, and just as Kim has been as well for the past 10 years or so. So you know, it was a really good five weeks in, um, in the Patent, which is like a city right beside Kathmandu. We had the opportunity to visit the Heart Institute in Kathmandu. And, uh, you know, I think there's a professional bond for, with cardiologists around the world for me. So, you know, many of the cardiologists here, and this is the head of the institute in the middle, and another cardiologist beside me, um, they took us on a tour of the Heart Institute, and it's a, it's a, it's a government-run institute, so patients don't have to pay very much, but it's still beyond the means of many patients. And then I met this young physician there, um, Suresh Tamang, and um, he asked. He also he worked at the Patent Academy of Health Sciences in the anatomy department, and he asked me. You know, he explained to me how medical school and training works in Nepal, and how they have to pay a great deal of money for residency positions. So you know, they can get accepted into residency, but then if they can't come up with the money, they can't accept the position. So one of the stories he told me that really struck me was how when he finished his MBBS, he worked for three months with an NGO doing health camps in remote western Nepal, like that's way worse than the Kumbu Valley and the Inca Valley. So, so he was trekking from village to village doing health examinations and, and treating, I guess, whatever he could in the villages with a group of international doctors as well as Nepali doctors. And uh, so he was saying how he was going from village to village, and I'm saying, wow, it must have been so beautiful to be in those mountains. And he was saying, you know, I was cold and tired and hungry because there wasn't much of a crop that year for three months. And I kept saying, well, it must have been beautiful. <laughs> and he would never, you know, the Nepalis never say, no, you're wrong. <laughs> He just said, he just repeated, you know, there was no food, there was, like, it was really cold, and uh, he was exhausted. And so finally I got it. Like, for me, the mountains are wonderful, they're a recreational opportunity, a chance to challenge myself, but I always come back, I'm well fed, I've got wonderful clothing, you know, it's hard, but it's still, still not that hard. Whereas for the people who live in the mountains, it is such a difficult existence just to get enough food and to stay warm. I realize, my goodness, my perspective is just so totally different from theirs. And it just makes you very humble to realize how small your own world is and how you know, other people's worlds are very different. 
So when we visited the, the Heart Center in Kathmandu, it was, it was a very nice place, very nice Heart Institute. It was a former shoe factory that the government decided would make into a Heart Institute. And they have quite a few surgeries every year, but look what the surgeries are for. Congenital heart disease because of poor maternal health and infections. Lots of congenital heart disease and lots of valve replacements because of rheumatic fever. So, you know, for us, it's mostly coronary artery bypass surgery that we deal with. For them, that's still not a major problem. They do have technology. They have three cardiac catheterization laboratories. They do very, they do the same procedures we do here. I'm sure they may do some of them better because of the bigger volume they have. They have great echo machines, state of the art. They do quite complex catheter ablation for arrhythmias. So, you know, the technology for advanced cardiac care is there. It's just not accessible to most people. And I was very struck in the corner of the ECG lab there, there was a small little cubicle for penicillin IM injections where people would come for their injections every three weeks to prevent recurrent rheumatic fever and uh, heart failure from valve disease. So technology is available for those who can afford it. This is actually exactly the same echo machine that we have here. So in the Heart Institute, they have good equipment and cardiologist and a cardiac catheterization laboratory. And then we asked the doctors who took, it up, took us on the tour, like, what are, what are your greatest concerns in terms of cardiac care in Nepal? And they said it's still like advanced rheumatic heart disease in remote areas of Nepal. So, you know, just 20% of Nepalese live in urban centers. The others live in um, very remote areas without real access to any kind of technology or ability to get out of there if they are sick. But there are also an increasing number of young patients with coronary artery disease. So Nepal, so in terms of health care in Nepal, there are lots of physicians being trained in Nepal, in Kathmandu and in Pokhara. Um, there are 16 medical schools, very similar to Canada. The problem is that most of those physicians either stay in Kathmandu to work or they leave the country. Uh, very, there are very few physicians in rural Nepal. So only about 20 to 25 percent of deliveries in Nepal are attended by trained health care workers. The doctor to population ratio is very good in Kathmandu, but as you move into the hills, it's uh, very low, and in the mountains, extremely low. So basically, itinerant international medical teams come through now and then. So the Patent Academy of Health Sciences that Kim has been involved with for, for many years and that I just recently became involved with is really the, the dream come true of Arjun Karki, who's the physician you may recognize Naomi Glick, one of our nephrologists on your right hand side. And Dr. Karki is a pulmonologist who came from a small village in Nepal and uh, did training in pulmonary medicine at Johns Hopkins University. But he really like has this burning desire to improve rural health care in Nepal. So really garnered support of a very large international medical community and um, people like us at University of Alberta uh, to develop curriculum and um, fundraise just for scholarships for these students from rural Nepal so that um, you could train medical students who will become doctors in rural Nepal. So the Patent Academy of Health Sciences is at the Patent Hospital that has 450 beds and it's kind of a, to me it looks like a community hospital with a large focus on obstetrics. It was established but a few years ago during cholera epidemic by UN Mission to Nepal. Uh, the hospital revenue, even though it is a government hospital, 86% of the revenue comes from patients, and if the patients can't afford the health care that they're receiving, it comes from donations to the hospital. And the nurses and social workers are very astute at assessing the patient's ability to pay. They look at how the family's dressed, the food they're bringing in, it's interesting, one of the, what the hospital director says, those who don't have, the really poor people, never ask for anything. They're just grateful for whatever you do for them. And that's 
one of the tests they use to assess their ability to pay. They have some new services. I am astounded that they have dialysis going on at this hospital. It just seems there's so much more they should be doing in terms of the general population in Kathmandu as opposed to dialyzing a few people with uh, renal failure. But obviously these are wealthy people and um, the service is there. But you know, this is a hospital that doesn't even have an oxygen plant. So for example, in the middle of the night, the patient's oxygen runs out and no one notices that there's no oxygen in their big tank. Well, they're just, they're hypoxic. And if they die, they die. It's just the way it is. So there's some very basic things we take for granted here that are not available there. The way the school is designed to get physicians into rural Nepal is, first of all, 50% of the students come from rural Nepal. So it's kind of selective admission. Many of them are on scholarships, and it's expected that they work in a rural setting for two or four years after their graduation. And what's really excellent is that they go out in rural communities from year one, or in the slums of Kathmandu. And they go with preceptors from, from, from the medical school, like biochemists and anatomists. And it's amazing, you know, in these countries, people don't travel. So a lot of the people who grew up in Kathmandu, they never went into the Himalaya. They just would never think of doing that. And the rural physicians have priority if they've done rural, um, some time in a rural environment. They have priority for residency programs. And they do seem to have fairly good telemedicine support. Um, when I was in Nepal, I really got to appreciate the importance of relationships and social connections. I think, you know, if you're pretty well to do in North America, I mean, you have your social connections, but they're less important to you than in a country like this where everything works with connections. So here is a, a photograph of Arjun Karki wearing that cap, and he, he's um, having a discussion with the Prime Minister of Nepal. I and mean, you have to do that medical school getting some government support. And, uh, yeah, and that's Dr. Bob Woolard, who's the head of family medicine at UBC, also very involved with this medical school. So just, just really important to be, to be on good terms with the government. And, you know, the people at the medical school, they go out of their way to make us feel welcome. And, uh, you know, they have dinners when we arrive, dinners when we leave. And just the way they write their emails, it's like always so courteous and, and kind. And uh, I think that's the currency they deal with. I mean, that's what they have. It's very low tech. And then, you know, in terms of, I so much time has to be spent on basic needs that you really don't have time for any more, you know, research or anything other than just trying to meet clinical demands. Uh, because a lot of your time has to be spent making sure you have clean water, and then, uh, you know, there's no refrigeration. Well, there is refrigeration, but there's no electricity for part of the day. There may, there may not be a generator that works. Um, so you have to just always kind of be looking after um, water and food. And that here during the winter, like, it gets very cold because there's no central heating either. It's quite cold. Just a lot of demands to meet basic needs. A lot of a lot of work to meet basic needs. So technology for health in low-income countries, you know, what I think they need to start off with, WHO has very little data on Nepal. I found that out. So, you know, they need to start collecting data on disease prevalence and risk factors so they have a better idea of what they're dealing with. And then prevention is really key in these countries. I mean, they need more vaccinations and especially better sanitation and, um, garbage collection and disposal and, you know, the trucks that they have are antiquated and just spewing exhaust in the air. Very, very bad environment. And then the importance of curative, affordable, accessible therapies. And the one that they have in cardiology, the one that they works really well is for mitral stenosis. So they're able to do very nice procedures, threading catheters up through arteries and veins, in, through the mitral valve, blowing up the balloon to open up the mitral valve. That's an ideal therapy for them because it's curative, at least for many years. Cures mitral stenosis. 
That's an ideal therapy. Low maintenance, just a one-time deal. But other problems like mitral regurgitation, valve replacement, they're putting in all these mechanical valves, and I have no idea how they're monitoring anticoagulation. So I really don't think these patients live very long, and they have complications and, and die from that, because I think we have one go at a valve replacement. So we've got to be simple. I mean, it can be high-tech, but it can't require maintenance. Cell phones are ubiquitous. Cell phones are wonderful in Nepal. Very easy to get. Like a cell phone costs maybe ten or fifteen dollars, um, and you just buy it at any of the little stores on the street. And then they have these little cell phone cards and end cell. You buy that anywhere, and it's just it's so inexpensive to uh, to make calls. And the internet is also it's not bad um, in Kathmandu wireless internet. Um, but I think I'm going to ask him to show a little film about a grant that Darren Nichols from the Emergency Department and Kim have put together to uh, try to get an internet service provider for healthcare in Nepal. I think that would be wonderful, you know, in a country that um, has such a difficult geography, because you can't send these young physicians out into that environment without supporting them. Um, So, you know, even at this monastery, in uh, the Kopen Monastery in, in Kathmandu that we visited, you know, the monks are on their cell phones. Cell phones are extremely important. When you're in the middle of a conversation with one of the physicians, the students have their cell phones on, but if one of the physicians, their cell phone rings, they answer it all the time. It, that's just the way it is, like in the middle of a conversation. It, it's important to them. So cell phones are accessible, cheap technology. And I, I think they are, they are increasingly being used for healthcare delivery in parts of the world. So 70% of the world's 5 billion cell phone subscribers are in the developing world. 90% of the world's population has access to a wireless phone signal. Even in India, a third of people in villages have cell phones. And most phones have texting ability and GPS. So cell phones are definitely a technology that's widely available. It was able to have, um, have reception at Everest Space Camp. Pretty amazing. So, you know, Nepal needs a lot of technology. Really basic stuff like clean water and sewage management is the first utility that needs to be at the top of the list. And then after that, just a reliable source of electricity would be very nice pollution controls. And then improved health, you know, really basic things like vaccinations, nutrition, um, rapid diagnosis and management of communicable diseases. And honestly, non-communicable diseases, I just don't know how they're going to be able to manage with that, like diabetes and hypertension that require ongoing medication, medications and monitoring. There were some beautiful things, though, in this land of little technology. <laughs> Um, there was a real sense of community, like, and families, and just people looking out for each other. And it's just, you know, you go from Kathmandu and you come back here to Canada, and you're just struck by how empty and drab and quiet it is. Like, I never felt that before. <laughs> After being in Nepal, I mean, I, I, that's just the way it is. And, you know, I like it here, but I also felt I was missing something that was there in Nepal. And you know, I, 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 there are many immigrants from South Asia who live in Canada and always thought, you know, they must like how much better life is in Canada. But after this, I also realized what they gave up to come to Canada. You know, families are extremely important in Nepal. And many well-educated Nepali citizens, or ex-citizens, come back to Nepal to look after their aging parents. They come back Australia, in the United States, when their parents live. And I think we have a lot to learn from that. Because, you know, Nepal doesn't have the infrastructure for complicated technology. And, you know, any Nepal is just, there's so many cases of a, a lot of money has gone into Nepal. And there's very little to show for it. But everybody
everybody's kind of doing their own thing, and you know, they, they, they deal with what they perceive as needs without the people actually being involved. And so it's like the hospital in Lufa that's, that's shut down, even though it's a beautiful building. And you know, there's a lot to be said for the simple life. In Nepal, they enjoy simple things like drinking tea together. And, um, and I, I, I really like that. <laughs> So um, as technology advances, will the gap between the have and the have-nots widen, I think, probably. But uh, hopefully some of this technology will also help the Nepalese and other uh, low-income countries improve their standard of living as well. Because I think we have to help these countries in, in ways that are sustainable. It starts off with education of the Nepali people. It's for our own good. Because with globalization, the infections that they have will come over to us as well. And terrorism is more likely a social gap widens. And then, you know, people travel to Nepal. And I think, I think once you've seen how hard life is there, it's really hard to ignore that. You want to do whatever you can to, to help people there. But it's hard to find good charities that you want to help. But it's not so easy. So uh, this is an example of a swing that they put up in a, in a village in Nagarkot um, during a special festival, the name of which I forget. But it's this beautiful big swing, and there's a person who's swinging on it. And you know, it's quite an elaborate construction. It comes down at the end of the festival. But as we were walking by to watch the sunrise in the Himalaya, this person yelled out to us, like, Namaste sunrise. And I think that really, you know, evokes the hope there is for, for, this, for this country and uh, how they deserve a better quality of life.